Okay, so today we're going to be talking about David Hume and his inquiry, okay? So I want to take a moment to give you a brief biographical overview of David Hume. He's an interesting person. Um, he was very precocious in his early life. So his father dies when he's two years old and he has an older brother. And when his older brother goes off to the university, his mother decides to go ahead and send David, who was at the time maybe 11 and change, off to the university with his older brother, just because that was how advanced his mind was. And while he was there, he did a lot of studying in terms of history and literature, as well as ancient and modern philosophy, and he did some studying of mathematics and contemporary science. Okay. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that Hume would have been very familiar with Descartes' meditations, and that in part he's reacting against Descartes' meditations. One of the ways to understand it is that Hume is going to have a skeptical bent to his philosophy, certainly, but his concern is going to be that Descartes was in some ways too skeptical and then in some ways came to too certain of conclusions. So as you're reading through Hume and contrasting to Descartes, Descartes starts out with this method of radical skepticism that says, okay, let's doubt everything, right? But by the end of the meditations, effectively the senses have been completely rehabilitated, right? Other than remembering, okay, my equipment is perfect for its kind and I have to remember to use it properly, I can go out into the world and experience the world and really not be too concerned as to how I do it. Hume is going to give us kind of a, an opposing structure of the argument in the sense that he's going to start out being very common sense. But by the time that his argument is done, we're really going to be in a situation of saying, oh my goodness, what is Hume really arguing about here? Okay. As a person, Hume was, um, as the French would say, a bon vivant. He liked to live the good life. I mean, in the beginning of his life, he um, spent a lot of time being an isolated scholar. And then that kind of caused a psychological crisis in him. And I'm wondering if that's maybe when he became more of the partier. But he did a lot of his philosophical writing in pool halls. So that's one of the things that I find really amusing about him is when he starts talking about things like the eight ball hitting the corner pocket as a philosophical argument. You, you just can't think of Descartes, for example, as being the sort of guy that would ever hang out in a pool hall, much less use that as the background for writing his philosophical argumentation. Um, and there's a funny story about David Hume. So one time, this story was told to me by Professor John McDermott during a graduate lecture. And one time, David Hume had a particularly good party night, I guess you might say, mm -hmm. and woke up in a ditch. And he's trying to get out of this ditch, and it's too high. He can't get out of it by himself. And there's an older woman and she's walking along and he calls out to her, says, you know, basically saying, please help me get out. And she says, well, why should I? Are you just some sort of drunk bum? I mean, maybe you're better off in this ditch. And he says to her, no, I'm not a bum. I'm David Hume, the philosopher. And she replies to him, David Hume, the atheist. And he denies being an atheist in this story and says, no, I'm not an atheist. I am David Hume, the philosopher, but I'm not an atheist. And she makes him recite the Lord's Prayer as proof that he's not an atheist prior to helping him get out of the ditch. Now, I don't know if this story really happened. I'm not sure if David Hume lied about being an atheist because he figured that this nice older woman was not going to help him out of the ditch if he admitted to being an atheist or what. But I think that it is an interesting story to keep in the background. 
in terms of as we're reading through this idea that Hume is eventually going to come to of Hume's fork, which is basically going to say that there are only two legitimate ways to have knowledge. One is through direct sense experience and the other is through the principle of non-contradiction. We'll get there, we'll get there. Um, but it is sort of important to remember because especially when he's talking about his section on miracles and the section before that, it might seem like he's discounting the possibility of God. And yet we have this other reason to believe that perhaps he had a more complicated view than we might otherwise believe. Um, so we were talking a little bit before during announcement about John Locke and Hume is an empiricist. What that means is that he is concerned with explaining the world through the notion of sense experience, right? So when you're asking for empirical proof, what you're saying is give me tangible proof of something, right? One of the main conversations between Melissa and Melinda is that Melissa wants empirical proof of the soul's existence, or at least she thinks that if you're going to base a decision on the basis of the soul, that there ought to be empirical proof for it, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a way in which Melissa is kind of an empiricist in a naive, pre-philosophical kind of way, okay? And the empiricists were a school if you will, right? They're a school of thought. Um, and Hume is not the first of the empiricists, but he is considered to be the greatest of the empiricists. But he is following along in the philosophy of John Locke. And I think that it's important to talk for just a couple of minutes about some of the ideas that Locke had and how those ideas contrast with the ideas of Descartes, okay? So just as a quick reminder, Descartes believed in this idea that there are innate ideas in the mind, right? You'll recall that he says, as I look in my mind, I notice that I find an idea of God there, right? The maker's mark argument that we discussed earlier in this semester. So Descartes has this idea that there are innate ideas that one finds in the mind. My idea of self, the idea of identity, the notion of God, and the ideas of objects of things, that these are sort of innately in the mind. Empiricists are going to reject this notion that there are innate ideas in your mind. And instead, they're going to say, no, everybody is born as a tabla rasa is the phrase that they like to use. And that's just basically Latin for blank slate. And what that means is every human being is born completely blank. And then as we have experiences in our lives, those experiences shape what we know and who we are. But we're all completely blank when we're born. Okay. Um, what do you think some of the philosophers that we've discussed already this semester would have to say about that? You mean like Aristotle? Sure. I don't think he liked it. Aristotle seemed to believe that the well, information was a seed in the soul, the body was the vessel. So. I think you're getting your Aristotle and your Plato confused. Oh, yeah. am I? Plato was the Plato and Socrates. I like that. Uh, yeah, so certainly there's something to be said for Plato would reject this notion of the tabula rasa, right? I mean, he would say, no, your soul had access to the forms prior to being born. Now, it's possible that your body is a blank slate, but arguing from the argument of recollection, he thinks that when you have these experiences, that they jog these things that they once knew. That's totally not going to be Hume's perspective or Locke's perspective for that matter. What about Aristotle? What do you think he might have to say about Hume's view? Well, I meant to say Socrates when I said Aristotle. I forgot about Aristotle. 
Yeah, Aristotle does seem to say, go out and experience the world and then engage in philosophical reflection of the world. Now, he did believe that substances have a functional essence, right? So the essence of my water bottle is to be able to hold water and that this water bottle is an excellent water bottle insofar as it is capable of holding water and it is a dysfunctional and bad water bottle that is further away from the prime mover if it has a hole in it, right? So, we're approaching that dualism problem we had last week, though. Let's talk about that a little bit more towards the end of class. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that Hume would have been very familiar with every single thing that you've read up until now, mm -hmm. right? At one point, he's living in the same part of France where Descartes had studied and is basically there because it's cheaper rent than being in Scotland. So he was very familiar with these ideas and he's reacting against these ideas. And he's doing so in a way that is going to be really revolutionary to other philosophers. Okay. So just to give you some context in terms of how amazing Hume is, the philosopher Immanuel Kant, up until reading Hume, had basically, yeah, he was teaching classes and he was writing, but he didn't write or say or do anything that was particularly noteworthy. And then he reads Hume and says that Hume awoke him from his dogmatic slumber. And he goes from being a person that we would have never studied or cared about to being Immanuel Kant cornerstone of Western philosophy. Um, if we were to go on and do another philosopher after Hume on the existence of souls, we would do Kant. And if I have time at the end of the semester, I want to try to give you just a 20 minute lecture overview on Kant's view of the soul, just to kind of round out the history of Western philosophy. The ethicist Jeremy Bentham, considered one of the fathers of utilitarianism, talks about Hume as having removed the scales from his eyes. Okay, So Hume is important both because of the ideas that he himself had and also because reading those ideas was literally like getting thrown into a tub of cold water for the people who were reading him at the time. And so he's also considered to be very historically influential in the history of Western philosophy. Um, a question on that? Mm -hmm. um, when we have this sort of philosophy, is it only Western philosophy? So that's a good question. In terms of is the class structure to be intro to Western philosophy, I haven't looked at the course catalog yeah. recently enough to remember where it's, whether it specifically says Western, but there's definitely something to be said for, in terms of my training at least, mm -hmm. it's mostly from the Western tradition. One of the things that I've tried to do this class is even though all of our readings are Western philosophy, I've tried to bring in comparisons to Eastern philosophy because I think that's important. Um, very quickly, even though this is a little bit of a digression, part of the thing with Western philosophy is when you talk about what is philosophy, there's a big discussion about that and what makes the methods of philosophy. But the consensus seems to be that textual interpretation and a strong emphasis on textual interpretation is one of the things that philosophers do. It's not the only thing that philosophers do because otherwise theologians and philosophers would be the same. But this notion of interpreting the text and spending a lot of time with text and that written ideas are important, that's a, a major tenet of Western philosophy. Whereas in Eastern philosophy, that's not so much the case. So if you look at China, for example, many Confucians were illiterate. And to actually read the Analects was not something that many practicing Confucians did, but it wasn't really considered to be a requirement of being a Confucian that you could read what Confucius himself right. wrote. And so, and I'm not trying to denigrate any of these other traditions. I mean, I have studied them somewhat and I find them very interesting and very worthwhile. But coming from the lens of focusing on philosophy as a textual interpretation, one of the things that ends up happening is that sometimes people make this argument that certain 
Eastern traditions are more religious than they are philosophical. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, I think that if you're reading the Analects and you're studying them, you're doing philosophy. You're not engaged in a religious practice. Um, you know, in the same way that I would say that if you're reading the Bhagavad Gita, you are engaged in a religious practice, even if it's non-Western. So I try to bring in as many components of Eastern philosophy as I am able. And I think that there are professors in this department that do explicitly teach Eastern authors. And in some of my other classes, I have. So, um, I mean, I don't know if you would consider him non-Western, but in my social and political philosophy class in the spring, we're going to be talking about Gandhi. That's a non-Western philosopher um, in his notion of non-violence. I was thinking in this case, uh, I, I was studying more on dualism and the history of it and the conflicts with it. And uh, I came across, uh, I forget his Western name, Ib Sawai or something like that, I forget the name. I'm terrible with names. Elysian or something like that. Or he's a Persian guy. But uh, uh, I'm, I, it raised a flag for me because it actually seems to me that Descartes was actually influenced by his work. And uh, like a lot of thoughts, and his, his work predated it, and a lot of it was pretty much text, textbook and like of this guy. And uh, he was like a medical guy that actually put books, you know, obviously in the Western sphere for medical. But I think if a learned man had time to follow the chain of author, he would come back to him and see his work in philosophy too. This guy was a very prolific author. I forget his name though. So it started with an A, but his real name in Persian whatever was Ib something. But uh, his book was actually pulled out of the universities and became, I guess, old when Descartes was done, actually, when he was dead, about the same time he was done and dead and published all this stuff. So. Yeah, I mean, and I don't know enough about Descartes' biography in order yeah. to be able to say, yes, he read this person, or no, he didn't read this person. Though certainly one of the things that is important about reading an author is to be familiar with everything that they themselves read. Right. Um, and speaking of physicians, it should be mentioned that Locke, although he comes down to us as being famous as a philosopher, at the time of his life, he was actually a physician. Mm -hmm. That was his practice. And he did not allow the publication of the second treatise of, on government during his lifetime because he was concerned about blowback right. um, for himself for that. So what we're going to be doing today is talking about Hume's model of mental activity, um, which is drawn from the second and third sections of the inquiry, okay? So as I was saying, Hume is an empiricist, which means that as far as he's concerned, the most important thing about how we come to know things is that we come to know them from experience, right? I know nothing when I'm born, and then I have these experiences, and on the basis of these experiences, I come to know something about the world. Now, there is a distinction between the experience, which happens outside of my body, and then my ideas about the experience, which happen inside of me. Right? So Hume is going to give us a model of mental activity that basically takes us from, well, how did I go from outside experience to complex idea about this experience? And this model is going to seem very straightforward and common sense, but then what Hume ends up concluding <laughs> on the basis of this model is not really as mainstream and common sense as you might think, right? And that's why I was saying earlier that he's kind of opposite of Descartes in that way, because right. Descartes seems really radical in the beginning, and then towards the end, you're like, oh, okay, well then, yeah. I just trust my senses and I use them prudently. That's what I was doing in the first place. Why did I sit down and read through all these six meditations? Whereas Descartes, or excuse me, whereas Hume starts out seeming really like he's not saying anything that's particularly yeah. extreme or problematic in the beginning, but then by the time that you get to the end of the inquiry, there's definitely a moment of, oh my goodness, right? I mean, for it to wake Kant out of his dogmatic slumber, he must be doing something that is going to pull a rabbit out of a hat. So the idea here basically is I have experience. And the experience is overwhelming. And I want to talk to you a little bit about this idea of experience being overwhelming. So when 
I have an experience of the world. I wake up in the morning or I'm going to sleep. There are all sorts of things that your senses tune out of your experience. Um, have any of you ever had the experience of being in a vacuum or in a sensory deprivation chamber or a cold room? A cold room, yeah. Not a room that is cold, okay. but a, a, a cold room that is being used for, say, making certain kinds of circuits. No. You mean a, yeah, a clean room? Okay. Yes, a clean room. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. I heard they're driving crazy, though. Like the soundproof room? Somewhere. Right, exactly. That's where I'm going with here. So the idea is that when you're in a soundproof room, what ends up happening is all of a sudden, because there is no other sound to distract you, you start noticing the sound of your own heartbeat and the sound of yourself breathing. The point that I'm trying to make here is that these are things that are going on right now, right? Your heart is beating, you're breathing, you're having all sorts of biorhythmic systems that are going through, but you don't notice them. And if you're in a room and the fan is on, you don't pay attention to the sound of the fan day in, day out, all the time, right? You just tune it out. And similarly, there's this way in which, you know, right now, sounds and visual stimulation and smells, all of this stuff is being thrown at you. But your senses do a fairly good job of filtering out, these are the things that I need to pay attention to, these are the things that I don't need to pay attention to, and that is how I remember my experience, okay? So Hume, what he's basically saying is, look, experience is incredibly overwhelming. But nevertheless, that's how we come to know things. And on the basis of experience, we have impressions, okay? And even the impressions, although not as overwhelming as the experience itself, are still what Hume calls lively and vivacious. Pardon? He's a poet. So the idea behind impression is that they are contents of consciousness, right? That this is the impression has been left upon my mind by the experience, okay? And I want to talk a little bit about the word impression. Um, and what I'm thinking here is I had a friend whose cat passed away. And when he had the cat... Um, Stuffed? No. Uh, <laughs> turned, cremated. Oh, okay. They gave him a little impression of the cat's paw, mm. right? So what they had done was prior to doing the cremation, they had taken just a piece of clay and taken the cat's paw and pressed down on it and then written the cat's name and, and the dates that the cat was alive, right? they had taken an impression of the cat. And I think it's important for us to think about this etymologically, right? To, that to impress upon means to press and leave an indentation. But there's a very real way in which the cat's paw leaving that impression on the clay, well, that's clearly not the cat, right? It's not as lively and vivacious as well, now that the cat is dead, I guess that makes him kind of not very lively and vivacious at all, poor Liza. But nevertheless, that the original cat when it was alive, right, was really lively and vivacious. And then you have the impression, which on Hume's view is still lively and vivacious. So much so that your brain is not actually able to process it or do anything with it except copy it. So, which might be inaccurate for me to say that it's not capable of processing it or doing anything to it because copying it is a sort of process. Mm -hmm. but. So, impressions are copied and when they're copied, they become Simple ideas. Now, 
One of the things that is interesting about Hume is that although he thinks that we are blank slates in the sense that there is no content to our mind prior to experience, right? You have to have experiences in order to know things. He makes the argument that humans associate the things that they come to know in three specific ways. And there's a way in which it does seem on his view that these are innate to human experiences, what he calls the principles of association, okay? And there are three principles of association. The first is resemblance. And that basically talks about how two experiences are similar. So when I look at this piece of chalk and I look at this piece of chalk, I can say, okay, they're similar in the sense that they're both white and they're both chalk, but you know, this piece of chalk is a slightly different length than the other. That would be using the principle of resemblance, right? So I have an experience of this chalk, that experience is copied into an impression or becomes an impression, then it's copied into a simple idea and I have a simple idea of this piece of chalk. And then I go through the exact same process with this piece of chalk and then my principle of association compares the two and says, oh, this one is a little bit shorter than this one. But they resemble each other in that they're both pieces of chalk. And on Hume's view, this is something that human beings do. We're concerned with this notion of resemblance, talking about how things are similar and dissimilar from each other. The second principle of association is contiguity. And it basically has to do with spatial ordering, okay? And this is really important because there's a, a way in which, okay, I take this bottle and I put it on the table, right? Now, when I do that, none of you say there is now no longer a bottle that is separate from the table. We all understand that there is an object called bottle and another object called table and that the two interact in a spatial temporal way that is to say they are next to each other in this moment in time, right? That's the principle of association of contiguity. And that your liquid's holding your liquid. Your glass is holding the water. That's the one that gets me. Except now the water is no longer in the glass. It's in my body. Ha, ha, ha. So contiguity is nextness in a spatial way even though this happens in a specific moment in time and then finally we have cause and effect which in some ways can be understood as nextness in both space and time, right? So the famous example is the cue ball hits the eight ball and then the eight ball goes into the corner pocket. And when I have those experiences, right, that leaves an impression, I already had a simple idea of cue ball and eight ball and corner pocket and pool. And when I see all of this happening again, I come, I use my principle of cause and effect to come to the conclusion that the cue ball caused the eight ball to go into the corner pocket. And that is what Hume would call a complex idea, okay? Now, the point here is that you have many, 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 many experiences of certain things, right? It's not the case that you have just one experience of chalk, and then you come to have certain conclusions about chalk. You have many experiences of interacting with chalk, or I don't know, maybe you don't, but I stand in the front of the classroom and so I interact with chalk every day, right? Come home caked in the stuff. So let's go with the example of something that we all know to be the case. 
or we think we know to be the case, which is sugar is sweet, okay? Now, how many times do you think you've eaten something with sugar in it in your life? I mean, real sugar, right? Got a story about that. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of times, right? Multiple times a day, every day for however many years you've been alive, that adds up to quite a few, right? So the idea is that when you taste sweet, a certain impression, and we could call it sweet sub one, enters into your consciousness and then is copied to produce the simple idea of sweet. Later, you taste something sweet yet again, right? So the first time, I don't know, you take a sip of, and since you were drawing the distinction between sugar and corn syrup, let's say that it's one of my personal favorites, um, Dublin Dr. Pepper, mm, yeah. which is made with pure cane sugar. So you drink some Dublin Dr. Pepper and you have that experience, that experience leaves an impression on your mind of mm, nummy goodness. Mm -hmm. And then that lively and vivacious impression is copied into the simple idea that, well, I mean, and, and this is kind of a bad example because when you're drinking Dr. Pepper, it has many, many, many flavors, right? It's not just sugar water, but you get the idea, right? That we can talk about it in terms of just isolating one part of the experience. And this actually makes good sense in terms of Hume's view because part of what he's talking about is that experience is overwhelming and that part of what we do is to sort of filter specific parts of the experience. Um, the philosopher William James is going to take this idea and talk about filters in a much more sophisticated way, but he wouldn't have been able to do so if Hume's idea hadn't come along. So once you understand this theory of mental activity, it's going to make understanding other philosophers that have come later um, much simpler. So later on in the day, somebody hands you a chocolate bar made with real sugar. And so the idea is, okay, you have that experience, that experience is outside of your body. Well, outside of your mind anyway, right? Then you take the chocolate and take it inside of your body, but work with me. Um, and you have a second impression, S2, and it enters your consciousness. It is too lively and vivacious for your mind to be able to handle. So it too gets copied a second time and now produces the second simple idea, okay? So at this point, and you can even think of this as an assembly line, right? These two simple ideas come to the principles of association. And I like to think of each simple idea as being kind of like a Lego piece that can trace its way back to experience and the principles of association as the ways that you put the Legos together. So Hume is basically saying human beings have three different ways of putting Legos together, resemblance, contiguity, and cause and effect. And where do these Lego atoms come from? Well, they come from the experiences that you have. So presumably prior to being well, right at birth, you don't have any experience. You don't have any Legos, but you have a propensity to be able to put Legos together once you have some Legos and you get them just from living. So you have the first experience which has been copied and is now a simple idea. You have the second simple idea and these two simple ideas are going down the assembly line to the principles of association. And which of these three principles do you think is going to be the most? Resemblance. Resemblance, right? There's a part of your mind that's going to say, hmm, there is something about these two simple ideas that is tasty and similar in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. So that causes you to have a general idea that, wait a minute, what is similar about the Dr. Pepper and the chocolate is that they're both sweet. They have this property, okay? And we could go ahead and symbolize this and call it 
you know, general idea of sweetness, however you want to think about it. Um, and the idea is, is this going to be the next, the last time that you taste something sweet? Hopefully not, right? So anytime in the future that you taste sweet, the process will happen again, and this will strengthen over and over and over and over. So you will come to have a general idea of sweet that will stay with you. Okay. Um, I want to take a moment to make kind of an odd example out of this. And I'm not trying to be offensive or anything, but I think it's an interesting way to understand Hume and it's also an interesting way to understand racism and how it occurs, okay? So I'll, I'll be a little controversial today. So imagine for a moment that you are a white police officer and you came from a rich part of town where there wasn't a lot of crime happening on the street, right? But you decide I wanna serve my community and I become a police officer. And your first assignment is a predominantly Hispanic and African-American neighborhood that is very, very poor and is very crime-ridden, okay? The idea is prior to having had this assignment, if you were living in a very, very white neighborhood, would you have had any experiences of people of other races? Not I mean, let's say for the sake of argument, because this is a thought experiment, so we can give whatever parameters that we want, that this person had never in his life prior to taking this assignment ever met somebody of a different race. And you might say, that's really strange, but I had a professor as an undergrad who actually told us that other than having watched the Cosby show on television, that he had never met an African American before going to college. Absolutely. Iowa farm boy. You know? I was gonna say this farming communities, ranching communities, just like one black guy like in 20 miles and some people never leave it. So anyway, yeah. point being, I've never had other experiences, right? Mm -hmm. Or this officer has that. So he goes on the beat and starts having experiences of a specific sub-demographic of people, right? So those who are both African-American and Latino and poor, and also because they're interacting with a police officer, people who are engaged in criminal activity, right? So he has one experience. That experience leaves an impression. That impression leads to a simple idea. And then it gets put in to the principles of association, right? Then the next day, he has another experience, goes through this all over again, okay? By the time that he's been on the beat for six months or a year, he's had all of these negative experiences about African Americans and Latinos, right? And because he then goes back to his secluded white neighborhood, those are the only experiences that he has with those demographics. What do you think, according to the principles of association, is going to happen? He's going to put these experiences in through cause and effect and become racist because there's a way in which that's the way that this assembly line has been set up. And this is going to sound a little odd to you guys, but I don't watch television. I try to avoid watching television as much as possible. I've never owned a television. I don't like exposing my mind to television. And the reason why is because when you're watching television, it's an experience and your mind is not really able to tell the difference between a television experience that is made up and unreal and a real experience. You know, so I remember when my car was broken into years ago, I really expected that like on the television shows, somebody was going to come out and have a kit, you know, and dust for prints and they were going to find the culprit. And I was really, really shocked when, you know, I waited for hours and hours and then the police officer eventually came out and said, well, there's no way for us to dust for prints because of how this window was broken. They shouldn't have even had you waiting out here for three hours in the heat. Thanks for trying, go away. There's no way that anybody's going to be able to track down the stuff that was stolen from you. You know, that's not what I thought was going to happen 
because I'd had all of these television experiences that had led me to have a general idea of police work, okay? And this is a little bit of a digression for a moment, but there is something to be said for when you have all of these experiences over and over and over again through the television, that leads you to have certain general ideas about something. And Hume's model makes it very easy to see how that would happen, right? Because my mind has these experiences, and those experiences leave impressions, those impressions lead to simple ideas, the simple ideas go down the assembly line, and they get compared in terms of resemblance, and in terms of contiguity, and in terms of cause and effect. And there's something to be said for every time that I have a certain experience, it strengthens this general idea, right? It doesn't come to be a general idea when you have one experience. It comes to be a general idea when you've had hundreds or thousands. So kind of a funny example, but if you've watched 200 romantic comedies, and in every single one of them, when the first kiss happens, the boy kisses the girl, and then you go on your first date and you're thinking about, hmm, I wonder, am I going to have my first kiss? As a young woman, you expect that, assuming a heterosexual context, that, well, he's going to kiss me, not that I'm going to be kissing him. And it's not like anybody ever gave you a rule book that said, oh, by the way, boys kiss girls not girls kiss boys, but they didn't have to because you've had all of this scripting that says these are the ways that these things happen to the point that, I mean, when I was teaching this in another class, I was thinking about it in terms of if I could think of romantic comedies where when there's a first kiss that the young woman kisses the young man instead of the other way around. And I, I was kind of scratching my head trying to think of any, right? So the idea here is that on the basis of the experiences that you have, you're going to have certain general ideas. And it should be mentioned that no two human beings are going to have the same set of experiences. Well, I guess conjoined Siamese twins, no. you might say, have the same experiences. But even then, you know, it might be that one head is facing in one direction and one head is facing in the other, and so they don't have the exact... One has a better concept of the left, the other the right. So that's what I would think of at first. So. And nevertheless, this you might find a little bit interesting. Even if they did have the exact same experiences, it is vaguely possible that they might apply the principles of association in a different way. So... You know, and I don't want to sound like I'm being non-sympathetic or not PC towards people who are in a situation of being conjoined. I do understand that that's heavily taxing on the body and so on and so forth. Like, look, I'm not trying to be an ist of any sort, right? I'm a fairly PC sort of person, but I do like to reflect on these things in a kind of tongue-in-cheek way. So, um... The idea in terms of Hume is that the process of going through, right, and I'm going to say this another 20 times, experience, impression, simple ideas, get plugged into the principles of association, become a general idea, um, that's going to be a little bit more complex when you're making a judgment that has to do with cause and effect versus resemblance or contiguity, right? There's a way in which resemblance and contiguity are both kind of one-dimensional, but there's kind of a second dimension when you're talking about cause and effect, right? Because time is also involved, usually. Part of how we say that one thing causes another is because there's a temporal conversation between the two. So the idea here is that this racist police officer may come to have this understanding that, well, all X people behave in a certain way that might be causal, but it might also be resemblance in a way, right? Well, the people that have this certain feature are also going to have this other certain feature. 
And it's a problem in the sense that we don't want people to be prejudicial, right? We don't want to be in a situation where you're prejudging somebody on the basis of what they look like. But nevertheless, if you've had 200 negative experiences with people that look a certain way, when you have the 201st experience with somebody who looks that way, principle of association of resemblance is going to mean that you're going to have certain expectations about how that person is going to behave. And it just makes sense, okay? So let's go back to sugar and sweet, right? The idea is I put sugar on my tongue to see what will happen. Will it taste sweet? Will it not taste sweet? How do I do this? And I can do this over and over and over again, okay? And it should be mentioned that sugar on the tongue is already a complex idea. And one of the criticisms that we can make of Hume is that we have experiences and they leave impressions. When I have an experience of drinking a Dr. Pepper, I'm not just having the experience of drinking something sweet, right? I'm also having the experience of cold, I'm having the experience of ice, I'm having the experience of glass. I mean, experience is overwhelming, right? There's lots of stuff going on. But his claim is that when it leaves an impression and then is copied again, there's a way in which the mind kind of breaks it up into tiny little chunks in order to make sense of the experience, but then eventually processes it through the principles of association in order to come up with a general idea. Um, and in your lecture notes, there's a nice diagram that basically says, okay, you have one experience, it gets copied, you have another experience, it gets copied, and then the principle of association of resemblance causes you to have a general idea of sweet, and then the principle of association of cause and effect kicks in, and then it says, oh, you know what? Sugar is what causes sweetness. Because what I notice about all of these experiences, the Dr. Pepper, the chocolate, mm, creme brulee, whatever other experiences of sweet that we want to talk about, what they all have in common is sugar. Okay. So each time that I am engaged in this experiment, right, of putting sugar on the tongue, then that's going to leave at least two impressions, which are going to be processed and they're copied and joined together to other simple ideas by means of the principles of association. Um, I think this model also helps us to understand a little bit about the notion of cognitive dissonance. Have we talked about this in this class at all? So um, let me give you, hmm, what's the best example? So here's a line, and it's basically talking about the continuum that you can have of a certain point of view. So let's say that we're talking about the death penalty, okay? And I'm born in a household where every time that somebody mentions the death penalty, it's considered to be good, right? It's a pro-death penalty household. You know, crime and punishment. If somebody commits a crime, they should be executed. I hear this over and over and over again. Well, then one day I'm hanging out with some friends and they say, hey, let's go listen to Sister Helen Virgin talk about the book that she wrote, Dead Man Walking. And she starts to make all of these arguments against the death penalty, okay? At this point, you have a fairly strong complex idea that the death penalty is right. And all of a sudden, somebody gives you an idea that is different. The model of cognitive dissonance basically says that when that happens, human beings react in an angered way to this new idea. That it makes you uncomfortable. And that sometimes that uncomfortable feeling ends up being projected externally 
onto the person who is giving you this newfangled idea that you don't like in a way that could be interpreted as angry or violent. And part of what the cognitive dissonance model tells us is that if you're going to go from being somebody who's really for the death penalty to being somebody who's really against the death penalty, that's not going to happen in one experience. It's very, very rare that people have one experience and then completely convert their mind from one point of view to another. What usually ends up happening is that they have to have multiple experiences, right? So first they go and they see the movie Dead Man Walking, and then they start writing to prisoners on death row in order to support them. And then pretty soon they start to have the perspective that they're against the death penalty. What does this all have to do with Hume? I think that Hume and his notion of experiences, impressions, simple ideas, principles of association, complex ideas, helps us to understand that. Because if I already have an entrenched complex idea, the death penalty is correct. And it's really strong, and I have lots and lots of experiences strengthening it, then you give me an experience that does not resemble those experiences, my brain is going to go, whoa, 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 what are you giving me here? You know, this is not a Lego that I was expecting. And my immediate reaction to that is going to be, Stress. Right. And then depending on how I handle that stress, I might become violent towards the person. Uh, are you all familiar with... Matthew Shepard and his story. Gay guy that got killed. Yeah. Does, do any of you remember the specific details of what happened to him? Mm -hmm. Jasper, Texas. Is that right? Or is that what was that? That was a drag. That was a racing. Yeah. Race yeah. Yeah. No, it wasn't in Texas. Matthew I think Shepherd it was. was either Colorado or Wyoming. Okay. I thought it was Montana. That was Colorado. It's about the same time as the racial one in Jasper, Texas, and I think it keeps popping up in my head. Really. I don't know okay, it. but so. There were some people that were asking, why did these guys get to the point that they not only killed Matthew Shepard, but they killed him in such a an awful way, right? And, and I can't remember the details of this, so it, this may turn out to be inaccurate, right? But I mean, that's the case for anything I tell you. I could be wrong. Um, but when Matthew Shepard died, it, I think it then came out that what had happened was that he had been talking to these guys in a way that was kind of seen as flirtatious. And that, oh, it was in Fort Collins, Colorado? I've been there. Um, there's a really good Thai restaurant there. <laughs> two hours. Um, so the idea is, if I have this idea, you know, homosexuality is wrong, and then you put me in a context where that idea is questioned, right? So maybe you come up to me and you flirt with me and, oh my goodness, I find it secretly pleasurable, right? right? But that challenges this complex idea that I've already had, your principles of association are not really going to be able to do much with that, I think. I mean, look, obviously this is not Psychology. Hume himself, okay? This is me saying this is a way that Hume's model could be used to explain other things that have happened in psychology. But part of the reason why that's important is because Prior to Hume's model of mental activity, we didn't have an understanding of, well, wait a minute, you have experiences and you process these experiences and that there are different ways that you can process these experiences and that this helps us to understand the variance that occurs in humanity just wasn't there, right? So when cognitive scientists hundreds of years later 
are giving really, really complicated models for mental activity, they were able to do so because, Ma because Hume gives us this very simple model. And for those of you that are going on to take psychology classes, I think it can be remarkably helpful to be familiar with Hume's model because it gives you a basic understanding, a basic blueprint of, oh, well, okay, it makes sense. I have these experiences. I have to process them in some way. I have different experiences, but somehow my mind, you know, connects these experiences together and it connects them in a certain type of way. Principles of association. Well, that makes sense. Now, On Hume's view, what's really nice about all of this is that all the complexity of your ideas are governed by a few relatively simple rules. So let's talk about some of the standard implications of this model, not the ones that I've been telling you so far. First of all, we must make copies of impressions in order to be able to shape them, right? that impressions themselves, I mean, thinking about it in terms of the cat, they're just too, like, squirrely for you to be able to do something with them. They are copied and joined to other simple ideas by means of the principles of association in order to function. Um, you can see that this could get quite complicated when the input of experiences is increased. Right? So for the purpose of this example, we've been talking about discrete, simple experiences, right? Drinking a Dr. Pepper, eating a chocolate candy bar. But think about the complex ideas that you have of your romantic partner, or for those of you that are single, that you have of your parents. There are untold impressions of every sensory modality that you have had about this person. Right? And those experiences have occurred over a long period of time. Um, and they've been copied and organized by the principles of association to produce a single but general complex idea of beloved. But on Hume's view, that complexity, oh, I guess I erased it, but that complexity is shaped on a certain structure. Um, and I think it is important to just make sure that we're all on the same page about this. Impressions can't be compounded or augmented in any way. Each impression is just what it is. It's when we copy them and get the simple ideas that we're basically producing versions of those experiences that are faint enough to be pliable so that we can manipulate them. Okay. And this kind of goes back to earlier in the semester, we talked about this idea of component parts that you can manipulate and component parts that you can't manipulate. Remember, that was part of the argument that was given for the existence of God, is that I couldn't have created the idea of God because I'm not capable of manipulating the constituent parts. This is kind of similar. There's a way in which experiences and even impressions are constituent parts that I'm not capable of manipulating. But when they're copied, then they become simple ideas, and those are constituent parts that I am, am capable of manipulating. They're more useful and pliable concepts. Um, one of the things that we talked about earlier is this idea that Hume is an empiricist. And what qualifies him as an empiricist is that any idea that I have in my mind, I can trace back to specific experiences. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute, knowing that this bottle is green, can I trace it back to the specific experience of my kindergarten teacher holding up a construction piece of paper and saying, this is green, and all of us repeating green? Well, maybe not, right? That was a long time ago, and I may not be able to trace it back to the specific experience, but you can imagine that, um, you know, so let's say that I had a child, and, you know, being the child of a philosopher is always a dicey 
proposition or philosophy professor, a lot of people will say that calling yourself a philosopher is only a posthumous claim, but I think we're all philosophers, so I look at the word a little bit differently. But philosopher with a lowercase p versus philosopher with an uppercase p. Nevertheless, let's say for the sake of argument, I stop making so many caveats and I just say, okay, I take my baby and I decide that I'm going to do this Truman Show style where the baby is going to have every single moment of her life recorded. And we have all of this data, okay? So 50 years later, the child comes and says, okay, mom, I want to know how did I come to have the understanding that this color is green? Well, then we could rewind the tape and say, okay, well, this was the moment that you had the first experience of green, and this was the moment that you had your second experience of green, your third, fourth, fifth, 770th experience of green, and this is how you came to have this complex idea. So the idea is that on Hume's view, each and every idea that is in your mind can be traced back to certain specific experiences, which means that there are no ideas in your mind that did not arise from some experience. And that's the reason why we call Hume an empiricist, because he's basically saying that everything that you know, you learn through experience. So empiricism, I mean, you can give a bunch of different definitions for it, but certainly one way to talk about it is that all of our knowledge arises from experience. And there are different flavors of empiricism, but Hume's flavor can be stated as the view that all knowledge is derived from sense experience. And he's going to be interesting in that his claim is going to be that even mathematical knowledge, to a certain extent, arises from sense experience from the perspective that I have an experience of mathematical knowledge, even though um, through the principle of non-contradiction, it's going to come to be the case that I can be certain of mathematical knowledge, even separately from experience. Okay, so on Hume's view, how do we make sense of imagination? Because it does seem to be that I can conjure up or dream up things that I haven't directly experienced, right? So I think in this class, we've talked about the example of Chocolate Mountain, and then we've also talked about, I think it was a dragon with fairy wings and six legs. I don't think that was this one. Okay. That was. Oh, I was doing this one. Um, so how about a Chocolate Mountain, and while we're at it, let's have a river of espresso and, you know, some little fluffy clouds of whipped cream and, I don't know, licorice trees. Certainly no one has actually experienced that because unfortunately it doesn't exist. No one has experienced that particular complex idea, yeah. right? But what you have had experience of is other experiences that you were able to, through Hume's model, boil down to certain constituent parts. Right? Well, once those parts have gone in, you know, either whether you want to think of it, I always think of it as an assembly line when I'm thinking about Hume's model, right? So these simple ideas, they come into the principles of association, which put them together. Well, it's possible for me as an imaginative person to take these simple ideas that I've derived from experience and put them together in new and imaginative ways. But in order for me to do that, there must be a sense experience that actually happened that I can trace it back to, right? So the first time that somebody told me about dragons, right? I'm reading Token and I'm hearing about dragons and I'm like, wow, dragons and they have scales. Well, what are scales like? And I can think, well, I've seen a snake. It had scales. I've seen, help me out here, other animals with scales. <laughs> I've seen an iguana, it had scales. So if I think of it being like an iguana scale, but much bigger, right? So as I'm, I'm trying to conceptualize dragon, I might start with iguana, 
and then add wings and then add fire breathing and then add bigger, you know, and interested in hoarding treasure. And pretty soon I have this idea of dragon, but it traces back to sense experience. Um, and it should be mentioned that since no two people will have the same set of sense experiences, but we do have similar ones, to a certain extent we can then say, okay, well, is my complex idea of dragon the exact same as your complex idea of dragon? Maybe, maybe not. And one of the things that Hume is going to talk about a little bit later is that we don't really have any way of comparing my complex idea about something to your complex idea about something. Or more accurately in terms of the text, I have no way of comparing my complex idea about something to the object itself. Um, so one of the proofs that Hume gives us that his theory must be correct is that no matter what idea in your mind you analyze, you will always find that, quote, that they, that they, quote, resolve themselves into such simple ideas as were copied from a precedent feeling or sentiment. Close quotation. Try to find an idea that you can't trace back to a sense experience. Lucid dreamers talk about it. They can't ever do anything more than they've ever always experienced. Can't ever make a new taste. It's always a combination of tastes. You know, I don't know that I've ever tasted anything in my dreams. Lucid dreamers will taste but they can never experience anything. Even they haven't already experienced yeah. it in their life. It's, it's like, that's like the beautiful thing about lucid dreaming. They try to find it and they can't do it. They can't ever find something new. Okay, well, if you think about this from the perspective of Hume's model, yeah. and you think about it in terms of dreaming being the process in which you connect things that you've experienced in a different way, then that makes a lot of sense, right? Because if I experienced a new taste while I was dreaming, where would I have gotten the constituent parts? Right. I can't get the constituent parts because I have to be able to trace them back to an experience. Um, so the second argument that I want to discuss with you is talking about people who lack impressions from a particular sensory modality, okay? So consider a person who is born completely blind, like my friend Nolan, he's going to have no concepts relating to visual experience. He can know the words relating to visual concepts, right? So he can say, well, I know that the sea is blue because he has had experience of people saying sea and blue in the same concept, but that is different from, from actually possessing the concept of sea and blue, right? And the reason why is because he lacks the ability to have, I mean, he can still have the experience of going to the sea, but he's not going to be able to have that particular sensory modality of it. Um, I'm running a little bit out of time, but one final point, it is a really common sense model and in fact, it makes such good sense that most people would not be hesitant to accept it as the basic view of mental activity. Raw material comes in, it's processed by the mental equipment, and the result is knowledge, or at least ideas about those experiences. Even Descartes probably would have a lot to agree with here, but it's going to turn out that Hume is going to use this model to springboard into some ideas that many of us would have a hard time accepting. And that's how Hume is going to go from something that seems really common sense into a form of skepticism that he's going to claim is the right amount of skepticism, which is where he's going to argue that Descartes failed. Have a good rest of your day.